The structure of a crystalline solid really depends on the size of the atoms or molecules that make up the crystalline structure, how many different types of atoms or molecules are contained in the crystalline structure, and the electronic nature of the materials that make up the crystal. And we're going to talk about those crystalline structures in this last section of chapter 10. We have defined a crystalline solid as a solid material in which the atoms or molecules are all arranged in this very ordered repeating pattern within the solid. Some terms that we have to use to actually sort of describe those repeating units are unit cell. That's the smallest unit of repeating sort of structure within the larger crystalline network. Within that unit cell, each point at the corners of those unit cells is call, are called lattice points. So in this case, this sort of looks like a cube. So this would be cubic in nature. And this green area here shown in the center is just the unit cell within the larger cubic nature of this crystalline solid. Sometimes we also include a depiction of the atoms and look at their relative size within that cuban cell cubic unit cell, as depicted here by these red spheres. Metals often form crystalline solids where the metal atoms themselves are arranged where we have one sphere, representing the metallic atom, in a layer which is either directly above or directly below other metal atoms. We call this crystalline lattice structure, simple cubic, which is shown here. So we've drawn my cubic unit cell down here in the center, which and the lattice points are represented by the center of each of the atoms of the nucleus. If I were to look just at the unit cell itself, notice that the unit cell only contains essentially one quarter of each of the metal atoms. Also notice that in a simple cubic lattice cell, all the spheres are directly in contact with each other. So they're packed as tightly as they can be. Another term that we use in crystallography when we're describing the crystalline nature of solids is coordination number. That is actually the number of atoms that are in contact with each of the atoms. So if we look at a cubic lattice structure, each atom is in contact with six different other atoms. So in a cubic crystalline material, each atom would have a coordination number of six. In addition to a simple cubic crystalline material, some metals actually form what is called a body-centered cubic, where my unit cell is still cubic, but right in the center is another atom or molecule. We also have a type of cubic which is called face-centered cubic, where my unit cell again is cubic, but in this case, I have a, another atom on each face that sort of fills in that lattice structure. So we have simple cubic, we have body-centered cubic, and we have face-centered cubic. So if we first look at this simple cubic, it has eight lattice points. Those lattice points are again defined by the nuclei of each of the atoms. In body-centered cubic, we still have eight lattice points here. It's defining the cube. But also in this case, my eight atoms that make up my lattice points, they do not actually touch each other in this case. They're actually pushed away from each other by that atom that's in the center here. And finally, in my face-centered cubic, 
I still have my eight lattice points here. But in this case, I actually have half of an atom here, which is represented within my cubic unit cell. And half of this atom here is in a different unit cell. In addition to the three cubic unit cells that we've briefly discussed in this chapter, there are 11 other types of unit cells. There are trigonal, orthorhombic, monoclinic, triclinic, hexagonal, and robohedral. Notice that if you look at these, some of them look very similar. The difference between these is actually the distance between the different lattice points of the unit cell. We're not going to discuss any others of these. If you were to take a course in crystallography, you would spend the whole semester just looking at these different unit cells, the 14 of them. When anions and cations come together to form a crystalline solid, we can still use that unit cell description of a crystal to describe the crystalline nature of the ionic solid. However, because of the large differences in the size of cations and anions, we often pick either the cations to define the unit cell or the anions to define the unit cell, most often the anions. For example, if we look at this structure here, I represent the anions by these eight different spheres here. They would come together to form a cubic unit cell, but in between them there would be a hole, and that hole would be filled by the smaller cation. So in other words, we call this a cubic unit cell with a hole in it. We could also have the anions arranged into this face-centered cubic structure. So here I go one, two, three, four, and in the middle there's a cube here. But in the center we're going to actually leave octahedral holes. If we look at these green lines here, just look at this center atom and look at the green lines here, that would form an octahedron. So that hole left in this face-centered cubic structure would be an octahedral hole, and that can be filled by a cation. And also, if we look at face-centered cubic structures, again, one, two, three, four, and the fifth one here would be my face-centered atom. If those are anions, they could be arranged, depending on the size of the cations, it could be arranged so I leave holes in the, these that would be tetrahedral in nature. So this hole right here could be filled with a cation and I go one, two, three, four, that would be a tetrahedral hole. Let's now look at some examples of ionic crystals in which either the cation or the anion form my unit cell and the holes are filled with either cations or anions. When ionic compounds are formed by cations and anions of similar size, we often form just a simple cubic structure. And that cubic structure can either be defined as the cation at the corners or the anions at the corners. For example, cesium chloride. Chloride anion has an atomic radius of 181 picometers, and cesium plus cation has an atomic radius of 165 picometers, similar in size. So we could define a cubic structure by the chlorine atoms with a hole in the center that is filled with the cesium cation, or we could define the cubic unit cell structure by the cesium cations with the anion filling that hole in the center. Either way, it's, we get the same crystal structure. If we have ionic compounds where the anions are much larger than the cations, like in sodium chloride, we can actually define the unit cell by the large anions having a face-centered cubic structure as shown here, 
in this diagram where I have one, two, three, four, five atoms here, where I have a face centered cubic structure, and the sodium atoms actually fill in the octahedral holes between that face centered cubic structure. I find that a little hard to see here in this sort of crystal lattice, but when I use the unit cell description, it's a lot easier to see. An example of a face-centered cubic cell where my holes are actually tetrahedral in nature is zinc sulfide. In this case, the sulfide atoms here form my face-centered cubic structure and my zinc cations actually fill my tetrahedral holes. If we look at calcium fluoride, CAF2, it also forms a face-centered cubic unit cell, but in this case, the calcium cations actually form the lattice points of my face-centered cubic unit cell, and the fluoride ions, shown here in yellow, occupy all the tetrahedral sites in between them. From just these few examples, I hope you can see how complex crystal really is. So how do we know all these crystal structures? What instrumentation do we use to actually determine the crystal structures? Because we still can't actually see the individual atoms. We don't have the technology yet to do that in a crystal structure. We use a technique called x-ray diffraction, which is a method used to bounce x-rays off the different atoms within that crystal structure. So in a very simple explanation. I have an incident beam of x-rays, but because of the wavelength, they're of a similar size to the atoms themselves, so they actually get diffracted or they get bounced off of each of the different crystal layers within a crystal structure. And once they get bounced off, they then actually get scattered out and they interfere with each other, forming a diffraction pattern. And if we do this from a beam source, for example, here I have an x-ray tube, so I generate very high energy x-rays. I send them through a beam and I let them bounce into a crystalline solid. And depending on how they get refracted or scattered, I form this pattern here. And if we do a bunch of math on this pattern, I can back out the crystalline nature or the unit cell nature of that crystalline structure. Probably the most famous X-ray diffraction study of all time was done by Rosalind Franklin when she took crystalline DNA and actually did a crystallography experiment on them and she was able to determine that DNA is actually put together as a double helix for which Watson and Crick then actually were awarded the Nobel Prize. If you look over here to the right this handsome young man in the blue shirt here drinking wine is actually myself and this very nice lady here is actually Linda Gerstein. She actually was one of the undergraduate students who was working on this project with Rosalind Franklin and Watson and Crick, both in England and in the United States. So here I am drinking wine with one of the people who actually was part of winning that Nobel Prize for the x-ray diffraction work and the double helix nature of DNA. And that's the end of chapter 10. We're now going to move on to chapter 11, which is the last chapter that we're going to study this semester. And we're going to be talking about solutions.